That looks good. Yep. Okay, I'm going to start the webinar and we'll let them build in for a minute. And then, um, but we are broad, we are broadcasting. So if you just give me a minute or two quiet, and then I'll start up. Good evening. This is Seven Seas Cruising Association, Boat Surveys, Why and Hows. We have a marine expert and uh, broker, Mr. Curtis Stokes of Curtis Stokes and Associates. We're going to review procedures used by professionals, review when and why surveys are performed, suggest what to look for in a survey, an instrument or an agent, a little bit of lessons learned, and a little bit on insurance, we have both Curtis Stokes here and Gary Golden. The goal, our goal is to educate cruisers on various aspects. We'd like to use this material as a reference, a checklist, or customized concepts for your specific needs. To the right is a boat lips checklist for an offshore passage. This is not a survey. This is what people do when they go offshore, they check their items on their boat. A survey should cover this and a lot more. Some questions to consider and we will cover. What are the types of boat surveys? Does a boat survey for insurance differ from a pre-purchase survey? Finding a survey agent, credentials, who does the survey? What's the responsibility? What are the key areas reviewed in a typical survey, the process? Out of water surveys, and then suggested seller's preparation process for survey. It goes both ways. You should see that in a boat when you're looking at it, but also if you're selling a boat, there's things you need to do and also examples of what to look at, some actual examples of problem areas. And how does a survey assist with a buyer's protection or decision process? Can a professional broker be used as an agent for the purchaser? Yes, they can. And that's the reason, one of the reasons that we have Mr. Stokes. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. At the end of this presentation, we will have questions and we'll answer questions in the Zoom screen. There will be a Q&A at the end, as I said, or you can ask your questions via the chat message. Our speaker and maritime expert, Mr. Curtis Stokes, Curtis Stokes and Associates, he's licensed and bonded. He knows the yacht brokerage business specializes worldwide in yacht sales, charters, and new yacht construction. I trust him, we would go to him in a heartbeat. He's almost everywhere with his facilities in the United States and worldwide as well. And you can find him at www.curtisstokes.net. Gary Golden, who is our insurance expert and longtime SFCA member, um, is going to chime in on insurance aspects. And he has um, a new insurance company that he, or not new, but a newer on the market insurance <laughs> company he's got. He's laughing. 
He's been in the industry for years and years and years. And insurance is one place that you have to have a survey for. If you don't have an insurance company that wants a survey before you get insurance, you may have a problem, but we'll let Gary mention that. So I'm gonna turn this over to Curtis and we'll start with types of surveys. Curtis. Thanks, Joan. Uh, good to be here and I'm glad everybody's participating. Um, so the types of surveys, the first one you'll run into uh, getting into boating is a pre-purchase survey. It's also known as a pre-purchase and valuation survey because there is a value included by the server in the survey, uh, which will be used for insurance and financing. This is you know, the most comprehensive uh, type of survey done uh, for you when you're first starting out. <clears throat> then over the years, be required to have an insurance survey. Uh, every insurance company is different. Gary can address some of the, the differences there, but the insurance survey is typically not as detailed as the pre-purchase survey. Uh, oftentimes I'll see insurance surveys that uh, don't include a trial run or don't include a haul out. They were only done at the dock. Um, and oftentimes I see it, you know, quite glossed over by the surveyor uh, rather than really digging in for a buyer. So uh, I always warn everybody, don't ask for surveys. I, I see new buyers, you know, has there been a survey done recently and they're handed an insurance survey and they think it's a pre-purchase survey. And I've even seen some buyers want to use that survey for their purchase of the boat. And you really just should not do this. Use a pre-purchase survey, be there, be present and learn and uh, you know, do your proper due diligence. Then you have an appraisal survey. You know, this is obviously done for legal cases, estates, uh, donations. It's a valuation survey, but just for the value side of it. And then of course, damage survey. Uh, if unfortunately you have an insurance loss, um, this, a lot of surveyors, some of the older surveyors I'm finding have stopped doing pre-purchase surveys. They, they, you know, gotten to the point where they want to get away from quote unquote, the emotional side of sellers and buyers and just want to deal with insurance companies and, and, you know, the, uh, the, the loss, uh, side of it. So, uh, uh, there, there's a transition, it seems over the years on surveyors doing the types of surveys they do, but those are the basic types of surveys. And then you have kind of a mixture of them depending on your needs. Gary, Gary. You no. mentioned something on insurance from an insurance, review, an insurance survey. Uh, sure. Um, it, it actually, touching on something that, that Curtis said that I wanted to comment on is, as I kind of have a sense, you mentioned that it's the older surveyors that have been around for a while that are more inclined to do uh, to stick to the insurance surveys and, and not do the pre-purchase surveys. And, and I, I kind of have a sense uh, that it's uh, for the, the reason that he actually described, which is that the pre-purchase surveys are much more detailed and they involve the surveyors climbing into the bilge and sticking their heads into places. And so the old, older guys don't either can or don't want to do that anymore. So I, I sort of have a sense that that's why the older guys are uh, move away from the pre-purchase surveys. Um, but, but also they are easier and simpler. Um, but uh, yeah, just, just like uh, um, Curtis mentioned, the, uh, the insurance surveys uh, are more of a, a cursory examination of the boat than, than uh, a real detailed uh, digging into all the nooks and crannies. Uh, and uh, and uh, one thing that uh, that you might want to know um, is that uh, there's another term for insurance surveys that that's commonly used, which is a condition. It's called a condition and valuation survey. Uh, and it's just just basically a synonym to a more cursory examination of the boat. So, but uh, but that's that's the types of surveys that we tend to see when we're working with a client that needs to that's had the boat for a while. And needs to switch insurance or, or he's just his survey has been old, as older and the, the new uh, or the existing insurance company is asking for an updated survey, that's when you would be getting an insurance survey. Um, and it's the, uh, the pre-purchase surveys that, that you'd want to get, uh, you know, anytime you're going to make the commitment and investment in a new boat. Gary, thank you. I'm, sadly, I pulled forward to a slide suddenly, but um, this is the <laughs> next slide and I'll turn it back over to Curtis. 
Okay. Well, actually, I apologize. I know the first line is missing for some reason, but finding a surveyor, what I mentioned there was two organizations that are typically uh, required uh, for surveyors belong to for uh, insurance companies and finance companies to be happy. One is the nickname SAMS and the other one is NAMS, the Society of Accredited Marine Surveyors and the National uh, Accredited Marine Surveyors. Um, look for uh, marinesurvey.org. And if you go to that website, you'll see a list of surveyors that belong to that organization. Remember, surveyors are not certified. They're not licensed. Anyone can become a surveyor, uh, but these organizations tend to hold them to a higher level. Some uh, surveyors will argue they're you know, just political or you've just got to go to so many conventions. But there are some educational aspects to them and, uh, you know, code of ethics. Mm -hmm. So you really should make sure that any surveyor you're interviewing is a member of either organization or the other, because uh, more than likely you'll need that. Uh, whatever you do, do not take the broker's or the seller's recommendation. That, you know, is, is extremely <laughs> unethical on a broker standpoint. Um, we're supposed to be independent and so are the surveyors. Uh, what I can do as a broker is provide a buyer a list of a couple of surveyors and their contact information and say, you contact them, you interview them, you make the decision and whoever you choose, then I can, as your broker, can coordinate all the details. Uh, but you need to hire that, that individual. I can help you with questions and you know, discuss it with you. But what I shouldn't be doing as a broker is saying, Pick this, bro uh, pick this surveyor over this surveyor uh, because I could have a relationship with that surveyor. So be careful. And I have witnessed it. I, I vividly remember years ago sitting on a boat with the seller, watching a uh, broker, a buyer's broker, and a surveyor who were clearly very best friends. And it was not a very thorough survey, you know, just so that they could get the deal through. So really be careful with that. Uh, but interview surveyor, you know, get references, go on the forums, ask others what their uh, experience was with certain surveyors and uh, ask for a sample survey report. That seems pretty simple, but you'd be amazed the number of surveyors over the years that have refused to give my clients a sample survey. They can white out the uh, previous client's name and information, or they can just have a blank one. Uh, but at least it gives you an idea of what a survey report's going to look like so you don't get one at the end of the survey and, and, and it's new to you. Uh, so, uh, you know, just really do your due diligence here. This Think of the survey as your insurance premium. You know, we all pay insurance companies a premium to hope that we don't get stuck with a catastrophic loss. Well, it's kind of the same thought process where you're hiring a professional to inspect a boat, hoping that they'll catch everything and you don't have any surprises down the road. They're human, you know, things happen, but your, your due, proper due diligence will save you a lot of money in the end. And I always recommend hiring a hull surveyor and an engine surveyor. There's a lot of money if, you know, if a sailboat has both a, uh, an auxiliary and a generator, um, there's a lot of money sitting there. And most hull surveyors are not mechanics. Some are, you know, in background, but most aren't. They'll do the basics, maybe an oil sample, maybe just uh, doing a visual, but it's worth every cent to get an engine surveyor involved also. Costs are, you know, typically 22 to $26 a foot for a surveyor for each surveyor. The engine surveyors charge a flat fee, uh, but it's about the same amount. And uh, these, these costs have gone up in the past few years. Uh, the 10 to $13 per foot is typical for what we call a short haul. Uh, you haul the boat during the survey, the buyer pays for this. And you're usually out, the boat's out for about an hour to an hour and a half at the most. A lot of times it's out over lunch and then the yard crew comes back and launches the boat. Typically we do the trial run after the survey haul out so that the surveyors have had a chance to make sure the bottom is clean. If it's not, they'll do a pressure wash, uh, the yard will at the buyer's expense. And um, they'll make sure that the running gear, you know, is all in, in good shape and blisters and things like that they're looking for before you go out and find there's vibration and things like that on the trial run. Um, 
And again, whatever you do, do your own due diligence. Don't buy a seller survey and sellers don't offer one. You know, what you're doing is you're increasing your level of liability by offering these surveys, especially an insurance survey. And especially if it's a newer buyer who isn't clear on the differences between the surveys. And so you want to just put that survey away because if it's three years or even three months old, that's antiquated. A lot can happen to a boat in 24 hours. So don't rely on a, an older survey that is, may not pick up something that just happened the night before. Um, and it, you don't know who did the survey. You don't know if they were friendly for the seller. Uh, you want, you, there's a real value to you as a buyer being present during a survey and learning from the surveyor and just spending a whole day on the boat with all these people you know, on there doing their, their inspections. So uh, do your own due diligence. Curtis, that's really good. Gary, from your point of view as with insurance, the insurance survey, do you need to verify who the surveyor is going to be or do you, how do you um, accept a survey for an insurance company, for example? Uh, well, some, some of the insurance companies have gotten even more stringent than they had been in the past about uh, only accepting surveys from the, uh, the two members of the two organizations that Curtis mentioned, SAMS and NAMS. Um, so there are some companies that just, have, just won't even take a look at a survey that's from somebody else. And there are others that are more flexible and they kind of, you know, just they'll take a look at the content of the survey uh, itself and, and, and not necessarily look for credentials. Uh, but that's kind of that's kind of shifted shifted over time. Um, and I was really heartened to hear Curtis say uh, to folks about not uh, letting a broker uh, recommend the surveyor to you because it's it's always been. Although I I, I mean I haven't necessarily seen a, an example like Curtis mentioned, but but there certainly is a, a, a temptation I think for brokers to to recommend to you the surveyor that's going to be the easiest. Uh, on the boat and, and help the sale go through. Um, so it's nice to hear brokers that are kind of like understand that that's a, an issue and, and uh, just kind of let people make their own decisions about who the surveyor is going to be. And that's why we have Curtis on this webinar. <laughs> and uh, Joan, um, and, and also in saying about insurance, and, and I'm sure Gary, you know, will probably agree with this, that a lot of the, um, some of the insurance companies, their underwriters who have been with them for a long time, you know, have moved on. They've retired and they're new underwriters. Uh, there's some new companies coming into the marine market who have less experienced underwriters. And I've witnessed a few underwriters who were by the book, you know, pretty much I could tell they were just going down a checklist. Whereas when I'm working with someone like Gary, I can tell when they're working with a, an underwriter who's very experienced, who can read between the lines and, uh, you know, say, okay, I get it with this, but if you do this or, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen underwriters come back to someone like Gary and say, have the buyer agree to fix every single thing in the survey before we'll underwrite it. And that includes polishing the stainless steel rails and the, uh, you know, and redoing the varnish. Uh, so you've got to make sure, for example, in the survey that your surveyor is experienced enough to know to put, you know, priority items uh, with an asterisk and then, you know, recommended items so that the underwriter knows what's important and what's not. Uh, because we are getting some, you know, a lot of turnover in every company out there, uh, whether it's a boatyard or, a, you know, a marina or an insurance uh, in company, uh, there, there are a lot of new people in, in businesses because of the employee turnover these days. That's a good point, Curtis. Uh, another thing I was going to comment on that um, is uh, you had mentioned uh, the uh, importance of su uh, supplementing the main survey with a, uh, an engine survey, uh, which is a great idea because, again, it's the most expensive. Even on a sailboat, it's the most expensive thing on the boat. Uh, with, with the possible exception of the rig. Rig, and, yeah. And that, that, that's what I was going to mention, actually, is that uh, one thing that surveyors typically, some will, uh, actually, when I was buying my boat, I particularly looked for a surveyor who was willing to go up the, up the loft and, and check the rig, uh, the masthead and, and, and all the fittings. Uh, but most surveyors, probably more than 90% of them, don't do that. Uh, they'll just 
do a cursory examination, uh, even if it's a pre-purchase inspection, they'll just do a cursory examination of the deck level fittings. Uh, and so there could be some serious issues up, up aloft. Um, and some insurance companies are starting to move in that direction of being more cognizant of uh, you know, possible rig failures. Uh, so they're looking at things like the age of the rigging. Uh, and so one thing that, uh, that often uh, seems to make good sense, and sometimes even the insurance companies will require it, is that you have a, a, a rigger uh, go aloft and, and do a rig inspection. So that's another, another supplement to the main survey that, uh, that sometimes you might want or, or might need to get. I would recommend everybody plan on that because I'm seeing that more and more. And um, I, I've had surveyor, whole surveyors who basically said, look, I, there are no records on this boat, so I can't tell you how old the rigging is. The rigging is obviously not original. Um, it looks newer, but because I can't tell you when it was replaced, I have to put in my survey that I recommend it be replaced. So you automatically have a surveyor telling the insurance underwriter, the entire rigging has to, standing rigging has to be replaced. Whereas if you hire a rigging company to come out and inspect it, they may find there's nothing wrong with it. And most insurance companies I find will accept the riggers uh, inspection uh, you know, report. And even if they say that it's, it's in good condition and, and it's not you know, within 10 years or, anything like that. So uh, plan on a rigging company these days. It's, it's getting more and more required. Curtis, thank you for that. And Gary, thank you for that. And I know that we just went through a survey on our boat. Um, and we did have a rigger certified. We had an engine surveyor and we did do the hull uh, separate. And we did haul out of the water. Um, and it's gonna cost money, but it's valuable. We did get the insurance coverage we needed. So let's talk buyer survey process. Curtis? So the typical pre-purchase survey, the surveyors like to start the boat in the water and they like what they call a cold start. Um, if you walk down the dock and the seller has the engine running and generator running before you get there, that's a red flag. Um, you know, they, somebody should explain to the seller, don't touch anything, don't run anything, don't change fluids. Uh, we want to start from scratch. So that's typically, you know, how it starts. Then you move to the boat yard and you haul the boat, like I mentioned earlier, and you're checking for running gear, you know, make sure everything's as it should be, any surprise damage. So often we'll find damage to the keel and the seller doesn't even know anything about it. Um, then we'll go and do the sea trial, or if you're not out at sea, we really prefer to call it a trial run. And they want to see the boat reach wide open throttle, full, full RPM at wide open throttle. Uh, so they want to see if it's over propped or, you know, uh, where, where you are on the RPMs. And they want to see if you're overheating. Um, I was telling Joan about a boat I listed yes, uh, about two days ago now, and the impellers had not been changed since 2017. And I said to the owner, I said, look, you know, I can pretty much guarantee you on the a survey, this boat is going to overheat because you haven't changed your impellers for so long. You need to do this. And uh, uh, that's just a priority, you know, for, and that, and heat exchangers, if heat exchangers haven't been cleaned for a while, uh, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to have overheating. Vibration, they're looking for that. You know, anything that they can come up with that's abnormal. And then we'll come back to the dock and complete the survey at the dock. Uh, some surveyors spend the whole day. Some are very efficient and can get done uh, with maybe a half to three quarters of a day. Uh, but you want to make sure they really are thorough and ask questions. On the fiberglass boats, it's preferable to try to not start the, the survey with the boat hauled out for long periods of time. Now, some surveyors will want to haul it out the night before, um, and some will want three days and then use the moisture meter on the actual hull bottom itself. But most surveyors want to start in the water, haul the boat. And the reason they're doing that is they want to see if there are any blisters. Blisters, a lot of blisters can contract and you can't see them if the boat's been out of the water for a while. So if you're just hauling it out, you'll see blisters if they're there, and then you'll see them slowly recede or quickly recede. Uh, but uh, be careful with boats 
that's already hauled out, especially ones that have been out for years. And I tell everybody, observe and ask, but don't interfere. I know everybody's excited, you know, buyers are excited and they, they want to learn everything they can. And that's great. But I've watched surveyors who have a process typically, you know, they, they're, they're doing this every day. And if you break their, their concentration, they're going to miss things. I see them miss things all the time. Uh, so let them do their thing. And a good surveyor will say, hey, come here. I want to show you something that I just found. And this is for both buyers and sellers. I tell my sellers, look, today is not your day. It's the buyer's day and their surveyor's day. You're just here to, with me to accommodate them, answer questions honestly, and help them any way you can within reason. Uh, but you don't have to lead the show. So step out of the way and let the surveyor you know, do their process without you kind of forcing everybody to, to do it your way. Excellent comments. Uh, Gary, do you have any thoughts or pretty much the survey process? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that that, that the insurance surveys, uh, uh, that is the condition and valuation surveys that, that are not so involved, uh, typically kind of follow a different uh, um, uh, requirement pattern. I mean, there's no, typically uh, you might, you probably will have to have the boat hauled, um, but the, uh, the couple things are the insurance, if the boat's been in storage and, and is already assured that's that's not and the end of the, and the survey is done with the boat solely assured there's no need for a seat trial or anything like that uh with re, with respect to an insurance survey uh a lot of people uh, a lot of my clients do tend to say you know do i have does the boat have to be in the water for the survey or, or does it have to be both uh and it can vary from situation to situation so you know you can always always ask your insurance broker about what exactly is needed in your situation uh, but uh, but I had a client ask me the other day, his boat's been out of the water for a couple of years and he's getting ready to relaunch it, but he needs a survey to do it. And so he's wondering how he's going to do that. And, I, and, and the underwriter will just, they'll be happy to see the survey report. So there, you know, you don't, you don't need to go through a, a you know, a necessarily an order or a process or anything like that. Uh, and sometimes they'll, uh, some, some insurance companies are a little, uh, can be accommodating, uh, if they do want the bottom inspected, uh, they'll, they sometimes, someone will allow you to have hire a, a, a diver, a professional diver to, to do the inspection. So not ever, not, not many insurance companies will do that, but some are more accommodating than others. And so usually on newer boats. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the new, I mean, the newer the boat, the more accommodating they'll be. Uh, and also, I mean, construction wise, obviously that's, that's a big issue too, because a, a, you know, a steel hold boat and any metal hold boat or, or wooden boat, uh, is going to, they're going to definitely want to, the boat to be hauled and closely inspected. So it's just the fiberglass boats that they're a little bit more accommodating on uh, about, uh, you know, some companies uh, aren't that concerned about inspecting the bottom. Uh, and again, some will accept, accept divers. Uh, but again, just to clarify, that's just for an insurance survey and, and, and not for a pre-purchase survey. And so that just emphasizes what Curtis just said, that don't take the insurance survey that somebody hands you and say that's good enough for you to buy the boat. Right, that's a great point. Typical survey issues. So, um, and I have some photos of, of, of a few, you know, surveys that I've been on. I have thousands of photos and some really unbelievable photos of things we found. But um, the typical things we see are blisters, uh, you know, large blisters, medium. And I'll talk a bit, little bit more about those as we look at the photos. But, uh, you know, blisters are not the end of the world, um, as, as some people feel. Uh, you know, there are a lot of boats out there with blisters and, and quite new ones. So don't let that scare you away uh, in most cases. And we'll talk some more about that. But the surveyors, you know, will find vibration underway uh, at different RPMs. They're looking at the exhaust and, and how much smoke there is, what color uh, fuel in the water, you know, from the exhaust. Is there steam? You know, what's the temperature? Uh, all of these come into play. Electrical issues are unbelievable. How many electrical issues, especially on the older boats? And as Gary can confirm, you know, just the number of electrical fires um, is, is just incredible, especially with the, the old shore power connections. Uh, we just had one in Marathon uh, back in February when I was there for a Great Loop event. 
and one of the boats, you know, they, it just, one of the connections came loose and, and the boat caught on fire. So, uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of stories about that, but they find a lot of this on surveys, crop hoses all the time, you know, dry rotting, um, just, uh, I'll show you some, some typical photos of that water intrusion on the older boats, especially the Asian built boats with all the teeth and ear. Um, and, and then of course, safety issues are the big issues and lots of maintenance. I was saying to Joan previ- uh, prior to the event, event here that we're really running into more and more maintenance issues. There, there are a number of people who have bought year, uh, boats over the past couple of years that don't you know, have a huge amount of experience and might not have taken into account the cost and, and amount of effort it takes to really maintain a boat properly. And they're now putting them back on the market. And we're watching boats be surveyed two, three, even four times before somebody ends up buying them because of sellers having to reduce their price or having to fix things that they were unaware of. Um, so I'm now actually telling a lot of sellers on my older boats, have a, a pre-sale survey done, uh, just so that you have an idea of what's going to happen on the survey uh, and, and you're prepared for it. And maybe you can deal with these issues before we get into a deal and lose a deal for a buyer because we're coming into spring. So a lot of buyers are anxious to buy a boat and get on and go, especially in the Northern climates. And they're not going to wait four to five months to deal with, you know, issues on the boat. They want to get going. So think about this as a seller uh, and, and addressing some issues that, you know, are out of sight, out of mind. All of these items are safety issues in one way or another. Yeah, true. Now, sellers preparing for a survey. Yep. So the first two items I mentioned earlier, you know, just don't run the survey or don't run the vessel prior to the survey, preferably within 24 hours. Don't run anything um, and don't change any fluids. Whatever you do, don't change any fluids because most buyers uh, want their surveyor to do an oil sample so they can have an oil analysis report. If you have zero hours on your oil, they can't do that. Uh, If you are thinking about selling your boat and it's time for an oil change, uh, do an oil sample and get an oil analysis report. I think you should have regular oil analysis reports during your ownership because they tell a story and it can help sell your boat. Uh, so you know, they're, they're very valuable. You'll hear people say, well, don't do an oil sample. You know, it's only one. Uh, you can't make a decision on just one. That's right. But if you have more than one, uh, it really does help. And it's just part of the whole equation of your due diligence. Where possible, try to remove your personal items and excluded items, um, especially ex- excluded items, so that it's not an issue. If it's not on board the boat, then no one's going to say from the buying side, well, I want this excluded or, you know, or included or you know that included. Whereas if you don't want to sell the tender with the boat and it's on there, I promise you it's going to become an issue. It always does. They, the buyer wants the tender included if it's there. Uh, but the surveyors need to get into cabinets and drawers and, you know, into lockers. Uh, so they really don't want it crammed full of all your stuff if possible. If you're living aboard. Hey, it's fully understandable. Uh, but I've certainly spent time on surveys, pulling a lot of stuff off boats and putting it on the dock and uh, then putting it back on afterwards and clean the vessel. I, you know, surveyors are human. And I have watched more surveyors go onto a boat and go, Oh, brother, not one of these junk boats again. Or, wow, this one is absolutely immaculate. And it does affect the outcome of their survey report. Their mentality, you know, uh, of what this boat looks like uh, really does reflect in their survey report. So if your boat is really clean, it shows you, you respect them. And I've seen it time and time again, a surveyor in a better mood when they get on a better vest, a cleaner vessel. Have your ownership documents on board, regardless of whether it's for sale or not. You're supposed to have your certificate of documentation and or state registration or state title on board for both the main yacht and the the tender. Um, But the surveyor is going to want to see those and they're going to want to take make copies of them from their phone Uh, and run your boat. You know, just when you're when you're out, just run it up to full RPM. 
uh, wide open throttle and make sure you're getting full RPM. If you're not, if you're losing RPM, it's time to call the mechanic in and figure out what's going on. And once you've hired your surveyor, uh, the, the buyer has hired the surveyor, the, the broker can coordinate the whole schedule. The seller doesn't need to do it. The seller doesn't need to uh, schedule the haul out at a boat yard. Uh, the seller can have input on which boat yard to use because you own the boat as a seller. It's your insurance. So make sure you have input. And if you're not happy with where they're going to haul the boat, don't let them haul it. Uh, if you're there as a seller or buyer, make sure you have, when the boat is hauled out, make sure you have your food, water, uh, medicine, you know, payment uh, for the buyer, uh, whatever you need to be there that day, because when the boat's hauled out, you usually can't get back on it to get that checkbook to pay or the camera to take photos of, you know, the, the uh, uh, below uh, waterline issues. So here were some pictures. So I, I included a number of photos to give you some ideas of what we're talking about. These are what we consider large blisters. And I know it's hard perspective uh, wise to see how big they are. I can tell you these are about dinner plate size. Uh, when they're dinner plate size, yeah, they do need to be addressed. But um, if there are, let's say there are a half dozen to a dozen dinner plate size blisters. I have very often seen surveyors say, look, over the ownership, over your ownership of the boat, when you haul the boat, have the yard dig some of them out and dry them out and fill them and fare them and barrier coat and then, you know, bottom coat it. Um, don't go and get talked into a massive uh, strip and, and, you know, uh, redo of the bottom uh, because unless the blisters are prolific, the whole bottom is completely full of blisters. You do not need to strip uh, a bottom and uh, rebarrier or coat it. Uh, it's a lot of money. And if you're planning to own the boat over a long period of time, then it, you know, you, you're going to spend a lot of money and possibly have them come back in different areas or in the same areas. So when they're dinner plate size, though, they really need to be addressed. And then if you go to the next slide, this is a medium sized blister, what I call a medium sized blister. And this is the size of say your, the palm of your hand. Uh, so uh, when it gets to the size of the palm of your hand, most surveyors say you really need to address it. Um, if you see just down to the left, you'll see a couple small ones, they're dime size. Uh, they'll usually say, don't worry about those until they get to the size of the palm of your hand. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that, you know, dime size blisters spread here and there, you know, really, I would not spend a huge amount of money dealing with these, live with them. Um, you're gonna waste a lot of money stripping the bottom over something like this. And then on the next slide, you'll see a typical paint blister and the surveyor will open up the blister and smell it and tell you whether it you know, smells like rotten eggs. And that's where whether they can tell whether it's a paint blister where it's just in the layers of paint or if it's actually gotten into the coring or into the gel coat. And you can actually see about just a little bit to the right uh, low, there's a blister that was punctured, kind of depressed in. And these are clearly paint blisters where the yard that did the bottom job did not properly prepare the, the bottom for the paint. It was just the top coat. They did a rough disc of it and repainted it and it was fine. I included this uh, alignment issue because this is actually is pretty common. Over the years, what happens, especially on the older boats is your engine mounts age and they start to settle and the alignment goes out. And this was a great example of one. This was, uh, and some of these photos I'm including are of trawlers um, just because they were good photos and I wanted to show the, the effect of this. This shaft is sitting in, this, in, in the tube and this shaft was about to snap and part and we canceled the trial run on this because it was so dangerous. It's, it was rubbing on the bottom of the tube and scoring the shaft and that weakens the shaft. And this, this could have been you know, a very bad scene 
uh, if we had continued. So when you haul the boat, you know, even without it for sale or on a survey, just check your alignment, look up there and make sure, you know, things like this aren't going on um, and, and then you deal with them well before a survey. This I put in because I wanted you to see the importance of pressure washing the bottom. Uh, when we hauled this boat, it was, it was fouled pretty badly and the buyer didn't want to pay the yard to pressure wash the bottom. The seller didn't want to uh, pay to pressure wash the bottom. The surveyor pulled out a piece of paper and said, well, then here, sign this, Mr. Buyer. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not taking responsibility for this because I can't see the bottom. And sure enough, when they when the yard cleaned it, he found this uh, crack in the plate, you know, in the rudder. So uh, all thing, all kinds of things show up when you clean the bottom and you can actually see stuff. So don't cut corners, do your due diligence and spend the money up front to catch this expensive stuff. So this is a, a good one. We we're sitting in the cockpit of this sailboat. And the seller is bragging about how fabulous his boat is that um, that he's taken it out in all kinds of weather. I mean, he's just punched through waves and, you know, just oh, unbelievable expounding on, you know, the, the, the horrific uh, seas he's been in. And I'm watching the surveyor looking at him and the surveyor gets up and goes straight to the forward stateroom and just looks and takes this photo. And I come in behind him and take the same photo. I, the bow was about to fall off this thing. I mean, it, it's a structural crack that was showing up through the wallpaper in the boat. It was incredible. And the seller just said, oh, it's just superficial. And the surveyor took his knife and just peeled the wallpaper back and it went right into the fiberglass. And that boat didn't leave the yard after that. So um, yeah, sellers, be careful what you say on surveys and uh, buyers, make sure your surveyors are really looking for uh, telltale signs like this. So this is again, another trawler photo I wanted to take, but it could happen on a sailboat. This was on a DeFever 49 uh, with Ford Lame engines. And um, the, uh, we went out and, and did the trial run before we did the uh, haul out. And unfortunately the exhaust hose on this mid eighties boat had the inner layer of the exhaust hose had collapsed. And because it had done that, it caused a lot of back pressure on the engine. And so that engine blew up on the trial run. The number six cylinder had so much back pressure on it. And I'm telling you what, if you ever want to see a, a human being come out of an engine room really fast, try that one because this surveyor, this engine surveyor was sitting next to the engine when this thing went. And boy, his eyes were you know as big as dinner plates. He came out of there, smoke billowing out. Um, you know, this stuff happens. This is why we haul the boat first. And I, if you're on a survey with me, one of the first things I do is I take my camera and I shine it up into, I, I focus it up in the exhaust pipe and try to get a photo of the condition of the exhaust hose, because this I've caught on numerous surveys on older boats. So think about, you know, the condition of the inside of your exhaust hose, not just the exterior of the exhaust hose in the interior of the boat. I will make a point too on safety issues, exhaust hoses and hoses themselves. When we start our offshore and I hear a boat saying they're taking on water, you have to go, if half the time you tell them, is it salt or fresh? If it's fresh, it's one thing, but if it's salt, then they've got to check every through hull hoses, the hull, everything. And they, it's, if they've got old exhaust hoses, that can be the worst place to try to track it down in uh, offshore. Um, so I, I get on boats all the time and I see condition issues like this, and it's a little hard to see where the hose meets the, the uh, nipple on the, um, the exhaust. You can see a gap there. The hose has slid off and the second hose clamp is not even on the nipple. So it is cutting into the hose itself. And uh, this, this hose obviously is way beyond its life. Uh, so if, if your bilge looks like this, if your uh, you know, hose looks like this, 
it behooves you to just change this out because this is not going to make it through survey. So this is a typical hose with dry rot cracking in it. Uh, but the one thing I like about this one that shows is over on the um, exhaust, uh, you know, the, the, you can see on the white, you can see the discoloring. And when this engine was running, you could actually see the raw water spitting out of the hose and spraying onto the painted surface. And so my point is that one, it's cracked, yes, and needs to be replaced, but there are telltale signs to look for. And this is one of them. A, a discoloration like that across from it means more than likely seawater is coming in and, and spraying on that, causing that. So that's what your surveyor is looking for. Uh, not just the immediate thing in front of them, but what else is around it that can tell them that something is wrong. This is another one, exhaust stains. Uh, you know, I, I got on this boat, saw the exhaust stains on the inverter, and I said, have you ever had a fire on board? And they said, oh, no, no. I said, have you ever had an exhaust leak? Oh, no, no. And I said, well, I don't know how it happened, but it happened. You've had exhaust inside this engine department, and, you know, it, you, you need to level with us on what it was. Well, okay, maybe years ago I had, you know, an exhaust leak. And I'll go on boats where I'll see it all cleaned up, but in areas where it's hard to get to, they haven't cleaned it. And so you've got to get your hose and your eyes up in the nooks and crannies and see how things have been cleaned. Um, I was on a, uh, a boat down in the Keys a couple of years ago, and I found same thing, exhaust stains. And then I was in the lazarette and I found some sand way up underneath the generator. I had my arm up underneath there and came out with sand. And so I asked the seller, I said, do you know anything about this boat? Was it a salvage boat or, you know, did it sink? Oh, no, no it didn't sink. Well, I owned it. I said, well, that wasn't my question. You know, did it sink that you know of in anybody's ownership? Well, and then it turned out it was actually a salvage boat. And this father and son had bought it to flip it. And so when I put the moisture meter on the transom, it just pegged immediately. So they had a fire and they cleaned it all up, not all of it, and the boat sank. And they were just flipping this boat after a, a precursory cleaning. So these are things your surveyor is looking for. These are things, you know, anybody with experience is gonna say, aha, you know, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And safety issues that Jones brought up a couple of times. Uh, surveyors are always going to uh, bring up an issue of fire extinguishers being out of date. And uh, most of you probably hopefully know that, you know, the Coast Guard's changing regulations on the age of the fire extinguishers. If they're over 10 years old, they want you to replace them anyway. Um, but they have to, the, your, your inspections have to be up to date. And I know it's a pain to get uh, a fire uh, uh, extinguisher company out to the boat. But if you have an engine compartment with a fire suppression system, uh, you, you have to have it updated. Uh, otherwise, it's going to come up on the survey and most buyers are going to want it dealt with or they're going to want money off to deal with it. Same with life rafts. I, when I list a boat, if the life raft is out of date, I just tell the sellers, take it off the boat. Let's get out of here. Let's not even have it in the photos. Um, you're better off buying a remanufactured life jack, a lifeboat, a life raft, than trying to have this one redone that's so outdated. So uh, just if you haven't kept your life raft up to date, just let it go, get rid of it. And if you're a buyer, you know, this is your life. Uh, so I, I would go with a brand new one. Spend the money on things like flares. Don't rely on somebody else giving you stuff that, uh, you know, is outdated and, and it's not going to work when you need it. And I mentioned electrical issues. Um, I, I probably have three dozen or more photos of electrical issues, uh, you know, and, and sellers tell me so often, Oh, we won't have any problem on survey. My boat is is just is is in great condition, and I get in the engine compartment or the engine room, and I find stuff like this, uh, you know, sulfating and and crazy wiring and uh, all kinds of stuff. So um, this is what your surveyor is looking for. This is what they're going to tell you is serious. 
and especially electrical issues. Look at this photo. I mean, you know, this is one of my favorites. What a rat's nest. Uh, it, it's just scary. Some of the things, the unprotected batteries, the, you know, the, just the, the cabling. Uh, it's just unbelievable what is out there. And if you see something like this, you know, as a buyer, just go find another boat. On electrical issues, one thing that we've noticed a lot is these boats that stay at the dock a lot and they keep their um, power, shore power cables fastened on the boat all the time. The boats move in the water. There's kind of a movement back and forth, wind or whatever. And it makes a vibration um, and movement in the electric cord. And it can act, that's one of the places you can get real problems with your electric cords. It really wears them out and it can cause shorts to um, the, the ground, to the uh, power, power panels. So, you know, everything needs to be checked all the time. Yep. Steel tanks, uh, you know, on the Asian built boats, uh, the surveyor is not going to do a pressure test. Um, they're going to look for telltale signs. And this is a perfect example of a telltale sign of a problem with a steel tank. So fuel, steel fuel tanks, uh, you'll, you'll hear, you know, our horror stories uh, on the Internet. Uh, in some boats, it's not that big of a deal, you know, to replace a steel tank. Uh, and not every boat with a steel tank is automatically a problem. I sell boats all the time from the 60s and 70s that have steel tanks and they're still in great condition. But you know, they, a lot of them have not been maintained properly. So look for these telltale signs. Is that the same for aluminum tanks? Well, sure. I mean, aluminum uh, can corrode uh, quite easily. I always remember, um, you probably heard of uh, Steve D'Antonio you know, he's very well known. And I was on a survey with him years ago on a 46 foot Grand Banks. And it was beautiful. You know, cosmetically, the boat was immaculate. And Steve and I are down in the galley and he pulls up the floor panel and he said, you want to see something? I said, sure. So he takes his mirror and then he takes a, a boroscope and he gets underneath the aluminum water tank and the bottom is completely rotted out. I mean, it is just and I said, sure, you know, look at the water in the bilge. It's just sitting there. That, that condensation has just eaten away the whole bottom of that tank. And nobody knew it. The water, you know, was just pouring right into the bilge. And so what happened was the tank was wider than the companionway. So it actually encroached into the guest stateroom underneath the bulkhead. So to get that tank out, they had to tear the whole area out to put a new tank in. So some of this can get very costly, but you've got to make sure your surveyor is thorough and looking underneath any metal tank, you know, anywhere. I did have an experience with a, a fuel tank where the, um, as, I, as I was listening to a seller um, talk about his boat and he didn't want the fuel tank filled up. Yeah. Yeah. So that's <laughs> the other thing. Water tank, he didn't want filled up. He didn't want the fuel tank. Up. Well, remember, a lot of these tanks that where it where it rusts the worst is on the top uh, because you have the deck fill. And usually, let's say on teak decks over the years, the UV from the sun will will uh, wear away the caulking around the fill and the water eventually works its way down the exterior of the pipe and sits on top of the fuel tank. And this is a, a very popular area for storing extra stuff, spare parts. And so you crowd that area and you don't see the damage being done. And the next thing you know, everything's sitting inside the steel tank because the whole top's caved in. So that's one area your surveyor will look uh, extensively if they can get access to it. Yeah, that's a big issue sometimes with tanks in particular is, is the access to them. Access, yes, absolutely. Especially with those uh, insulation panels all over them, like so many did. Um, I mentioned overheating. This is an impeller that we had to pull. And, you know, we had a new impeller on board, thank goodness. Um, the surveyor actually changed the impeller for the seller. Most surveyors won't do that. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you haven't changed your impeller as a seller recently, you really need to do so before a survey uh, otherwise, more than likely, we're going to have overheating issues.
and just dirty bilges. Uh, again, just a surveyor getting in looking at this is going to have a negative reaction. And I just see it all the time, surveyors commenting, going, okay, you know, everything's working, but, and, and so if your bilge looks like this, you're, you know, whatever you can do to clean it up and make it more presentable uh, really will go a long way in resale value. And duct tape. <laughs> duct, as much as I love duct tape and as much as I use it on my boats, they're not for sale. So I can get away with it. But if you're selling your boat, you can trim this duct tape all you want, but it's not going to get through survey and it's not an approved uh, leak uh, resistant uh, product uh, for surveys. Seriously, I, I, I see duct tape used in the most incredible places and um, they've really come out with some nice looking duct tape, but it just is not appropriate. Uh, you got to got to fix the cause. Uh, teak decks on the older boats, big issue these days uh, because it's so expensive to remove these and it's causing so much water intrusion into the coring. Um, it, it, if your decks are looking like this, you know, you're going to get dinged on the survey. Uh, if you're a buyer looking at this, this is a problem. Uh, so uh, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of work to get rid of these. And your hull identification number, your HIN, is supposed to be on the transom on the you know, upper portion, uh, starboard side. Now, number of sailboats will have it, let's say, on the starboard hull, uh, sometimes below a rub rail. Um, sometimes it won't be there at all, but technically it's supposed to be on the hull, uh, preferably on the transom and on the starboard upper corner. If it's not there, you really should go to like an award store or a sign store and have one made and uh, epoxy it on, screw it on, whatever you have to do. Uh, because I see surveyors all the time uh, mention this and it's such a little item, but it hangs it up and the, the insurance company and the lender will require it. So uh, these gel coat cracks that I'm told so often uh, are, are just superficial cosmetic and don't allow water in. A lot of times they'll be under a rub rail. Uh, and we this was again on a trawler and the buyer did buy the boat and he hired the yard to do some work and they pulled a hole for a through hole and this water just came gushing out. I mean, just, it was unbelievable. It went on and on and on. And over the years, this hole, the coring, it just filled up with water. And uh, it, it, you know, the surveyor said, you got high moisture readings everywhere. I can find some delamination, but they were insisted on buying this boat and it was a huge project. So where you see this cracking, the surveyor needs to get their moisture meter out and they need to get their phenolic hammer out and really test these areas because not all of them are superficial. And some more water leaks around port lights, uh, you know, this, where these uh, Asian built boats have veneer everywhere around, uh, you know, cleaning this up, obviously before a survey will go a long way. Uh, but the other thing is I, I have a lot of clients that will get rid of the veneer and use a Formica material, something like Formica in this area, uh, because you fix this port light and it's going to leak again someday. You're either going to forget to close it and you're going to get underway or uh, you're going to be in a rainstorm or washing down or uh, it's just the seals are, are going to dry rot and it's going to leak. So that might be an option instead of re-veneering uh, an area like this. And this is my favorite photo. This is my wife, Jill. Uh, I don't just put this on to embarrass her, but uh, we were delivering a yacht from New Zealand to Australia and uh, we'd been in a refit for a year. And you know, anyone who's been through that passage can tell you it gets pretty gnarly. And yeah, we'd run in some weather and the shipyard, somebody in the shipyard had left a uh, rag in one of the scuppers and put the grill back over without seeing it uh, on purpose or by accident. And so we were taking on a fair amount of water and it was all good except for one area above the galley. And I came down from the wheelhouse and here was my wife dressed up like this, trying to get some food out for the crew. 
while bailing, uh, you know, in, in, in pans and buckets, uh, all the water pouring through from the uh, uh, exhaust uh, above the oven. So it, it can get pretty bad, you know, uh, when you have to wear something like this. <laughs> I think She'll kill me for that, too. Fashion show. We need to have a fashion show. <laughs> So this is kind of wrapping it up where uh, if you, as a buyer, uh, have, you know, said, said, look, there's some issues on the survey. The sellers agreed to repair them. Uh, you're remote from the boat. Um, and you, really, you don't want to go back to the boat to see that the repairs have, done, have been done. What you can do is have the broker or surveyor or somebody, you know, local, even the seller, do a video of moving the through hole handle that was frozen and prove to you that it's operational now um, or a series of videos, you know, with, or a series of photos, and especially if they're date stamped. <clears throat> so this will prove that the repair was done without you having to go back to the boat. So, you know, think about it a little bit on, uh, on, on how you deal with issues from afar uh, don't give up on the boat, but have them repaired and have somebody prove they're repaired uh, this way. You know, that would also be a good idea. Gary, I don't know what you think. You know, on our insurance surveys, they always say, you know, confirm that, you know, check, check, check. But if you also uh, video what you have done with a date stamp, it proves that you did do that modification. Um, I yeah, think that... anything to protect yourself is a good idea. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't think that an underwriter would want to see that, but it's probably not a bad idea for you to have yourself so that later on, if you have a claim, if you're having to make a claim and, and the insurance company starts to question whether you really did something or not, you at least got some proof some, that it was taken care of. Yeah, some proof. And so, you know, here, be flexible. Um, this was a 47 foot motor yacht up in New England. And the uh, seller would not allow us to move the boat to the nearest boat yard. And so the buyer was about to give up. And we said, well, hold on, let, let, let us think this through. Let us talk to the seller. We found a trucking company uh, uh, with a low boy and we hired them to haul the boat out at a public boat ramp. So here's a 47 foot boat coming up a, a public boat ramp with everybody standing around watching this scene. And the trucker gets it almost up and the slime on the ramp keeps them from getting this huge, heavy boat up the boat ramp. He hadn't really thought about all the slime. And so we had to call a towing truck in to come and tow the tow truck or the towing company's truck to get it up into the parking lot. So the surveyor could actually survey the bottom and then put the boat back in the water. So sometimes you just have to make do. I know, you know, anybody that might be watching this from some of the remote islands is probably familiar with uh, you know this type of flexibility, but we have we all have our processes. We all have our certain ways we want to do things, but you know sometimes you have to think outside the box. The insurance guy is wincing. Yeah, yeah. We didn't discuss this with him until afterwards. Yeah, um, and and of course the worst uh, photo is uh, you know when the sea trial's really gone bad and sea toes pulling you in uh, in from the sea trial. So. Uh, that's that's when it's really bad and you know maybe it's time to to move on to something else so let's do some question answers um the webinar presentation covered surveys uh agents the process um uh, uh, preparation for surveys examples a little bit on insurance we have some questions let's see what we have here um Guiana Davis says, in the case of a steel hulled vessel, when insurance companies request a survey, they want to see the results from an ultrasound. We ask what an ultrasound grid pattern the insurance company needs to see from several insurance companies and haven't been able to get a definite answer. Insurance companies say it's a requirement for steel hulls, but there's no details requiring how the testing should be performed. The tighter the grid pa pattern, the more data points in detail, which means a higher cost to perform the testing. Ultrasound surveyors say they usually only do close grid patterns and there are known issues. Can you provide any details on what's required to get insurance on a vessel with a steel hull? It's a, in parentheses, a 1992 build 
from a well-known professional U.S.-based builder. Thanks. Uh, Gary? Yeah, that's uh, not surprising that, uh, that that you wouldn't be able to get from either an insurance agent or, or the company, insurance company involved some any kind of detailed information about how to go forward with that process because they've always been, and Kurt, Kurt has kind of implied this earlier that you've got uh, you know, people at these insurance companies that are either either new to it or just going by the book or don't know anything but the book, uh, and uh, and so they've been told, well, you have if it's a steel hull, you have to get an ultrasound, and that that's pretty much all they know, uh, and so they, um, so that's kind of good in a sense for the boat owner because as long as you can provide them with an ultrasound report and 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 the it, uh, the surveyor is not concerned about any particular issue, then then you're pretty much good to go. Um, you know, and it sound, sounds like uh, this particular person might have run into a, a particular particularly conscientious surveyor who doesn't want to do something unless it meets certain requirements. But uh, but again, it's uh, you know that I've never seen uh, an insurance underwriter say you know this this ultrasound report doesn't meet our standards. They just, they want a piece of paper that says ultrasound at the top and, and doesn't say anything bad about the boat in, in the text. And, and that's pretty much all you need to do. Yeah, I've never seen that either. Um, I've, I've never seen an underwriter second guess a surveyor. What they do want to see is some synopsis from the surveyor saying the readings are you know, uh, acceptable uh, because most underwriters aren't going to understand the readings that they're going to see you know, in, the, in the grid. Thank you, Curtis, and thank you, Gary, for that on the steel hull boat and ultrasound. Now, again, Davis also asks, there's been talk about insurance companies not approving boats with um, um, lithium ion lithium ion batteries, unless they've been provided by specific companies <clears throat> installed by the recommended installer. If the installation meets the ABYC requirements, why would an insurance company use this to deny coverage? Can you talk about the issue? Um, Gary, I'll let you talk first, but I'm sure Curtis has a lot to chime in on that too. Yeah, it's uh, I, I don't see it as a widespread issue amongst underwriters. There's there's one or two that are, that have made this an issue, uh, and, and obviously they probably paid claims for some boat that had some type of lithium battery on it. Uh, and to my my sense of it is it's an overreaction. Uh, it's uh, uh, for any of you that were at the uh, the St. Augustine Dam. Uh, last November, uh, there was uh, somebody that uh, was talking about electrics uh, on the boat, and, uh, and and it was pretty much clear from from his talk and and from everybody in the audience there that that this is the wave of the future. It's it's uh, what's going to become more and more common. So any insurance company that thinks they're just going to not insure boats that have lithium batteries is going to be getting a smaller and smaller piece of the pie as time goes on. Um, that being said, I, I would anticipate that as it does become more common and they start to see themselves losing more and more business, they're going to realize that they can't keep this up and, and change their position. Um, but, uh, but there's various different types of lithium batteries. Uh, the, the newer ones are much safer. I mean, you know, some of the, the, uh, the lithium ion batteries did have some fire hazards and involved with them, the, the, the more common ones nowadays in the marine environment are the iron phosphate uh, batteries, and, and they're much safer, much better at self-managing themselves. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not common yet, but it's, but it's becoming more and more common as time goes on. Uh, uh, and, uh, and as I said, there's one or two insurance companies that you're going to run into an issue with. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you, uh, one of them is Markel American Insurance Company, which is the underwriter of the Jackline program, which a lot of cruisers uh, tend to, to have or, or, or want to get. Um, but, uh, but they have not, uh, I haven't heard anything. They were supposed to have some year end meetings to discuss that issue, uh, but apparently that got postponed into this year. And I haven't heard anything further since then about if they're actually changing their position or not. Curtis, do you have any thoughts on that battery question? Really, the only thing I've seen uh, when this type of thing comes up, not just with lithium ion batteries, is it's my impression that 
the insurance company just didn't want to write the policy. So they were using this issue to deny uh, writing it. Um, it you know, just it, it was a good reason not to write the policy. And if, if that's what you run into, then, you know, get with Gary or somebody and, and shop around for somebody else that's you know, more uh, willing to look at it. Thank you for that. And I want to thank you both for this presentation. We've run over our time a little bit, but I know that the participants um, stayed on and we certainly have quite a few attending on the live stream on YouTube. So thank you both very much, Curtis Stokes and Associates and Gary with Manifest Marine uh, uh, Insurance. Um, you have um, been an SSCA member for a long time, and we appreciate you offering your expertise to us uh, for this webinar. And thank you all very much. Um, thank you, Jim. Yeah, it's a we'll pleasure, Jim. And have a great uh, season. Good night. Good night.